PC building, a basic process which is thoroughly analyzed in a variety of manuals and videos on YouTube. No more complicated than Lego bricks. All you have to do is follow simple instructions, and even if you're a complete beginner, in an hour or two, you will be able to enjoy the first successful start of your very own machine. However, there's plenty of nuances here. In fact, so many new of them have appeared in the last four years that we decided to make this video, from which you will learn how a minor detail can reduce the temperature of Intel processors, how to increase the overclocking potential of RAM just by installing it correctly, why a BIOS update is not always a good thing, why it might not be such a bad idea to get water cooling for your PC. This is MK. Today we're talking about important nuances of modern PC rigs. What do you normally start building your PC with? You take the processor, insert it into the socket of the board, close the latch, and voila! You can apply thermal paste and install the cooling system. It used to be that way until recently. That is, until enthusiasts found out that Intel engineers were clearly skipping lessons on material strength at university. The fact is that the most recent LGA 1700 socket for the 12th and 13th gen core CPUs turned out to be made of such soft metal that it just bends when you install the processor. Because of this, the contact between the CPU lid and the heatsink gets loose, which causes the temperature to rise. Intel, of course, has not admitted their fault, so the burden of fixing it fell into other companies' hands and the users. As a result, a reinforcing frame for the LGA 1700 socket was created, which you can get on AliExpress for about $5. Of course, there is little sense in it for the cool i3 or i5, even a box cooler would be enough for them, so you wouldn't be able to tell the difference with the frame or without it, but in the case of the i7 or i9, which Intel has officially driven into 250 watts of TDP, the difference can be quite noticeable, 5, 7 or even 10 degrees, which is comparable to changing the cooling system to a more expensive one. There are also nuances with the application of thermal paste. There are a huge number of videos about it on the internet, but it may be worth recalling that toothpaste and mayonnaise work much better for their direct purposes. And the works of art with tic-tac-toe on the processor lid is nothing more than entertainment if you feel bored. And here's a shocker for you. Well-known quality thermal pastes get counterfeited. This mainly concerns the popular MX4, which is quite expensive and allows unscrupulous sellers to put the similar GD900 into the tubes and sell it while turning good revenues. Of course, Arctic is trying to fight this, but it's not a big deal for Chinese manufacturers to clone a QR code. So if you don't want to replace the dried out thermal paste in a year, it is better to buy the original in official stores. Paying a little more is well worth it here. Oh, and by the way, forget about preventive replacement of thermal paste once a year. A quality thermal interface retains its properties much longer than that, and if your CPU doesn't overheat, replacing the thermal paste is just pointless. On the other hand, getting expensive thermal paste with a high coefficient of thermal conductivity makes sense only for top and hot processors, where every degree counts. If you're using a relatively cool Ryzen 5 or Core i5, you can use thermal paste which comes with the cooling system. Usually it will be behind the expensive solutions by a few degrees at most, which will not play any role. And yes, forget about liquid metal. The T1000 not only conducts heat better than other thermal pastes, it also does it perfectly well with electricity, and even one unnoticed droplet on the board can kill it. On top of that, liquid metal destroys aluminum and copper, so it should be used only with nickel-plated heatsinks. So leave this aggressive substance to overclockers. Processor installed, a thin layer of thermal paste applied, it's time to install a coolant system. But what kind? A few years ago, we would say that there is no place for a liquid coolant system in an ordinary PC. It really was so. Most processors, even top-end ones, were not so hot and getting a water coolant system was a waste of money. Now everything has changed. Intel's competition with AMD, as well as the inability to keep shrinking the process node as much, led to the fact that 200 watt processors are not only the Core i9s now, but sometimes even Core i5s. AMD is even worse. Because of the chiplet structure, 8 hot fast cores are located in a small die, cooling which is not a trivial task at all. Therefore, if you're building a system with a new mid or top tier processor, and also planning to remove power limits, water cooling is something that you might actually want to consider. Of course, you need to remember about leaks, the inability to replace the pump, and many other possible issues that come with such cooling systems. But water cooling is now something that has got a lot closer to us regular users. Still, all of the above is true only if you load your CPU with heavy tasks. 
When gaming, power consumption of even top N i9s rarely goes beyond 150 watts. So if you limit the CPU at this TDP level, you can easily go with a tower cooler. In this case, your temperatures will be a little higher for sure, but still far from critical. And most importantly, you won't have any water cooling related issues. Moving on, let's talk RAM. We're not going to talk much about dual channel. I'm positive everyone knows about it. This issue often concerns pre-built PCs and laptops where you can stumble upon a solution with 16 GB of memory, but in just one module. Of course, in case you get such a machine, you can always buy a second RAM stick, but this is also extra money and not everyone needs 24 or 32 GB of RAM, and on top of that, disassembling your device will most likely remove your warranty. However, the dual-channel mode of operation also has a nuance which contradicts logic. It would seem that the modules need to be placed in the first and the third slots from the processor, so that the dual-channel works and the modules are physically closer to the CPU. However, in fact, this is not the case. Of course, with such a setup, the board will work, but there might be issues with the XMP profile and not to mention overclocking. The thing is that historically, memory has been placed in the second and fourth slots, and if you do it this way, you'll have no problems with any of that. So keep that in mind when installing RAM. But it's still worth it reading the manual for the board you purchased, which should specify exactly which slots should be used for the dual channel. RAM dealt with, moving on to the drives. NVMe says these are cheap now, and you can get a pig and a poke one terabyte drive from AliExpress for about $45. We covered this topic in detail in one of our previous videos. Do not risk using such SSDs as your system drive. But if you're desperate to save a buck, you can get one such SSD to store non-sensitive data that you're not afraid to lose. And formally, connecting an SSD should not be an issue. For example, the diagram of the popular B660 chipset shows that you can install three NVMe drives on such a board. And one more can be connected directly to the processor. But there is a trick. The chipset itself is connected to the processor by the DMI 4.0 X4 bus, which in terms of bandwidth is at the level of PCIe 4.0 X4. That is, such a bus will only be enough for one fast SSD, and even then, not quiet, since all USB, SATA, sound and network devices and many other peripherals are connected through the same bus. So it turns out that in a system based on such a chipset, only one SSD connected directly to the processor will be able to work at the full speed of PCIe 4.0 X4. Of course, all of this is absolutely not important if such drives are used for games or other multimedia, or if these drives don't have to work simultaneously. In such a case, you would hardly ever feel this bandwidth limitation. But if you're planning to constantly move data between at least two top end PCIe 4.0 SSDs, you will need a very expensive Z790 chipset, where the DMI bus is twice as wide, or you can also cut down the graphics card interface using a PCIe to NVMe adapter. Also, on some boards, due to the lack of PCIe lanes, when connecting two NVMe SSDs at full speed, some of the SATA ports may be disabled. There are usually two or four more of them left, but you need to remember this when connecting SATA drives so that when your system doesn't detect a 100% operable drive, you know right away what the issue might be. In addition, when buying an SSD from AliExpress, you can run into the same problem as with thermal paste. It could be counterfeited. The Chinese platform is abundant in fake Samsung and VME SSDs. Do not get those. Graphics cards. Here for once we can see the first serious change in the ATX standard over the past decade. A new 12-pin 12-volt power connector appeared, which is designed to replace the old 8-pin, up to 4 of which would be required for a modern top-end card. You probably already know that the implementation was not exactly smooth. In the case of the RTX 1490, the current for each contact of the new connector is now up to 2 times higher than it was with the 8-pin. And therefore, if you do not insert the connector properly, it will be a bit loose or bent, the increased resistance coupled with high current leads to the connector's overheating and sometimes even melting. And due to the fact that the new connector is quite tight, not everyone is willing to put so much pressure on the video card when it is already in the motherboard. So it makes sense to plug the connector first and then install the card onto the board. At the same time, graphics cards became more power hungry and their heat sinks larger. In the case of a third-party RTX 1490, the heatsink may occupy up to four slots, and simpler solutions do not really lag behind all that much. So alas, but now, the graphics card holder is a necessity. Without it, the heavy card that's putting pressure on the board can both damage the motherboard and lead to bending of the card's PCB, which in turn can cause it to malfunction. 
Therefore, if after installation it is noticeable that the card is sagging, it makes sense to spend some extra $5 and get a holder, of which there are many different types on AliExpress and wherever else. And of course, let's talk a bit about the PCIe connector itself, into which you insert this card. There are plenty of videos on YouTube demonstrating that even the RTX 1490 is more than happy with the 3.0 bus. Switching to 4.0 gives only a few extra frames per second. However, you need to understand that this is really true only in the case of top-end cars that have a huge amount of VRAM. In this case, only data necessary for the game to run is transmitted through this bus, and there are no issues. But this is not the case with cheaper cards, and the most notable example is the RX 6500 XT with 4 PCIe lanes and 4 GB of memory. When connected via PCIe 3.0, the card will rely heavily on your system's RAM, which will increase the load on the bus which is already slow enough. This leads to the fact that the frame rate difference between PCIe 3.0 and 4.0 can reach 20-30%, to and of course connecting it to PCIe 2.0 makes no sense at all you can lose up to 50% of performance. That while the card is not very fast in the first place. Thus, now you should also keep track not only of what version of PCIe you have, but also how many lanes your graphics card has, which can be a huge limitation for cheaper solutions. New things to keep in mind have also appeared in the power supply units. The reason being modern hot CPUs. The thing is that two CPU power connectors used to be the prerogative of only top-end boards with Z chipsets for which you would normally get top-end power supplies, which would normally have the necessary connectors. Now, however, mid-tier boards with B and H chipsets can have 8 plus 4-pin CPU connectors, of which many 500 and 600 watts PSUs cannot boast. And therefore, a question arises. Can you use only one 8-pin connector in this case? And in most cases, the answer is yes. More than 300 watts can be transmitted via 8-pin which is enough for most top-end processors even under load. On top of that, usually the limiting factor will be rather the power supply zone of the CPU of an inexpensive board, which simply won't be able to supply the necessary current. And taking into account the fact that usually mid-tier Ryzen 5 and Core i5 processors rarely consume more than 100 or 150 watts in real-life workload, one 8-pin connector is enough with a good margin. Additional 4 or 8 pins are there more for complacency, and to give the board a top-end look. In fact, only few solutions on C-chipsets will be able to supply half a kilowatt to the processor, and they are basically toys for overclockers. By the way, since we have already started talking about the nuances of the motherboard's VRM, they have now become the main deterrent factor when upgrading. The thing is, the basic Ryzen 5 or Core i5 usually do not exceed their 65-watt limits in games and minimally exceed it in productivity tasks, so even simple boards without heat sinks on the power zone can cope with them. The problems start when you try to power up top N i7 or Ryzen 7 on them, in the case of which the company's boosted clock speeds beyond 5 GHz, generously flavoring it with high voltage and disabling the TDP limit. And to power up such monsters, you need a board with a good VRM, so if you're planning to further upgrade your PC, it's worth checking on the internet how the board you have chosen handles modern top end processors. And going back to the PSU, another life hack just for those who upgrade gradually. Imagine this situation. A new power-hungry graphics card has already arrived, but you don't want to power it up from your old PSU. For a quick check, you can supply power to any PC component from several PSUs by turning them on using jumpers in a 24-pin connector. This is absolutely safe and will allow, for example, to test a new video card in an old computer without completely rebuilding it. Also, some of you might want to use this setup on a permanent basis, in this case, you can get a special 24-pin splitter, so that both PSUs start by pressing the power button on the case. The process of building is sorted out, now you need to configure your PC. And here too, there are some not very obvious points. For example, many recommend updating the BIOS to the latest version. This seems to make sense, since such updates eliminate possible errors and security problems. But in recent years, cases when an update removes a function have become quite frequent. For example, Alder Lake processors originally came with the support for AVX 512 instructions, which greatly speed up work with AI and virtual machines, for example with the PS3 emulator. However, Intel decided to cut the support for these instructions in desktop processors, and most manufacturers, by means of BIOS updates, have disabled them. AMD has a similar situation. In beta versions of firmware for the 400 series boards, PCIe 4.0 support was enabled if a processor with a similar bus was installed. 
However, this feature did not live to see the release, so even with Ryzen 3000 and 5000, the 400 series boards will work only through PCIe 3.0. Fortunately, modders have learned to return the cutdown functionality for the up-to-date BIOS, but the fact is this. Now, updating BIOS without any reason is not something that you should do. And if you need it for a reason, it's better to wait a bit and see what changes they may have implemented. And by the way, Windows 10 and 11 are now able to adapt to new hardware that they detect, so you don't have to set up your new PC from scratch anymore. Just install your drive from your previous PC that already has Windows on it, Turn everything on and Windows will reconfigure and install all necessary drivers automatically. Yeah, you may lose your activation if you pirated your Windows, but in this case, you probably know what to do. By the way, although Intel recommends using Windows 11 with their 12 and 13 gen processors, because only it has an advanced thread director feature that manages E cores and P cores, in fact, it clearly looks like a collusion with Microsoft, because a comparison of the latest versions of Windows 10 and 11 showed a difference in performance at a marginal level. And at times, the good old Windows 10 turned out to be even slightly faster. So if you don't like the new OS, you can keep your Windows 10 for now. By the way, starting with Windows 10, safe ejection of USB drive is no longer necessary. In the latest versions of the system, the way Windows works with external drives has changed. So now you can pull your USB stick out of your PC at any time. It will not corrupt the already recorded data. There is another fun fact about modern days PCs. Did you know that computers do not actually shut down anymore? And it doesn't matter how you turn them off, through the start menu, the power button on the case, or by pressing Alt F4. In any case, after the shutdown screen is gone, the PC doesn't actually turn off completely, although it doesn't show any signs of life either. It's all about the fast startup technology, which, when you turn off your machine, saves the state of the system kernel and drivers to the hibernation file, so that it loads faster the next time it is turned on. The function is certainly useful, but it can also harm stability. After all, if there was some kind of failure in the system, it will be saved to the hibernation file as well and will be restored at the next boot up. Thus, if the stability of your system is more important to you than some couple of seconds saved on booting up, you can safely disable this feature. If you want to turn off your PC completely, just click the shutdown button while holding shift. If you want fast startup to be always turned off, you need to click choose what the power buttons do in the control panel on the power options tab, select change settings that are currently unavailable, and uncheck fast startup. Also, you can just reboot your system, because it will always turn your machine off completely and then turn it back on. As you can see, there are some details that may not be obvious at literally every step of building and configuring a PC, and knowing them can significantly simplify life and help avoid further problems. If you know some other nuances of PC building and configuring, let us know about them in the comments. My name is Mikhail Kroshen. The communication session is over. Bye.